a meaningful uh, holiday time with your friends, but most importantly, a time of uh, worshipful devotion to Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's such a privilege to be coming back again, and this time for the first time in a couple of years, in person on January 1st. So let's just ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given to us to be studying your word, to be meditating on your word, and to be challenged by your word on the first day of this new year. We thank you for the safety you've given us. We thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon us. And we pray as we dedicate our mind and open our hearts, we pray that you would speak to us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this year we are going to be focusing on deeper, further, and greater. So I don't know if you have ever wondered as you walked uh, in woods or in a forest as you saw these huge trees that are subject to various elements and a huge winds or, and rain and some of the challenges that most of us face. And these trees are outside exposed to the elements and yet they do not fall down to the ground. Now, some of them are very high, 100 feet. The, in fact, the recorded tallest tree is about 121 feet or so in California near uh, San Francisco Bay. So have you ever wondered what is it that makes this tree, huge trees, to be standing erect even though they are exposed to the elements all the time? Now, one of the main reasons why these plants or trees are able to stand still because of the anchorage that the root system provides for us. You know, one of the studies suggests that the surface area of a plant or a tree that is above ground is almost equivalent to the surface area of the roots that are below ground. So this root system, it provides an anchorage. Anchorage for the uh, plant for the tree to be able to withstand all of the challenges that the tree is exposed to the elements. So in addition to the anchorage, the roots also absorb, absorb water and minerals and nutrients that make it possible for the plant not only to survive but to produce uh, carbohydrate and other fruits that sustain life on this planet. So this anchorage and absorption are the two most important aspects of the root system, and yet we do not see them. So as we really look into this uh, theme in the next few months on deeper, further, and greater, if you're going to have an impact further across the globe, or even in our neighborhood, or in our places of work or study, or if you're going to have a greater effect, then it's all dependent on how deep we are. How deep we are in our convictions. And of course, the depth of our convictions are brought up uh, or dependent on the way that we are brought up. Our family background, the values that our parents have uh, instilled into us. But those values can only take us so far. But the real depth that we get is the values that we get by spending our time with Jesus. Now the word of God will enable us to be able to stand against the tide of the wind and waves and all of the cultural shifts that we are going through in our generation. You know, and the cultural shifts that we are going through in the last 10, 15 years are so significant compared to at any other time in history. Like for every generation, like a generation about 30 years ago was about 10, 15 years old. But now a generation is about two to three years old. So as you and I want to withstand all of the cultural shifts that are happening, then we need to make sure that there is depth in our relationship with Jesus. Now in the passage that was just read to us today, uh, it talks about Jesus having just finished preaching to multitudes. 
You know, three of the four Gospels actually narrate this story where Jesus had preached to multitudes and the, the specific message that he had given in this particular occasion was the parable of the sower. But after he had preached to the multitudes, the Bible records for us that Jesus calls his disciples out from the multitude. So today, as we stand on the first day of 2023, you know, our lives have been so influenced by the crowd. The crowds that are crying out, whether to crucify him or to cheer him up, or crowds to influence our convictions. So Jesus, in this particular story, was calling his disciples from the crowd. And not only was Jesus calling his disciples from the crowd, but he was also calling the disciples from their crowded lives. Now for three years the disciples were with Jesus and their life was very busy. They, Jesus, as Jesus was ministering in different places, healing the sick and raising the dead and preaching the word and many, very often it was multitudes that were gathered around Jesus. So the disciples' lives were always surrounded by crowds and they were always, their lives were so filled or crowded with activities. And Jesus was calling them from the crowd and from their crowded lives. And where was Jesus calling them to? He was calling them to a time of solitude with him. So that now the disciples had to leave the crowd and get into the boat to be with Jesus so that they could have that special time with Jesus and that they would have a special revelation of who Jesus is. So as we come into the first day of this new year, now Jesus is calling us from following the crowd. You know, following the crowd is a life of mediocrity. It's a life of compromise. It's a life that sometimes even kills our own convictions. So Jesus is calling us out of the crowd. And Jesus is also calling us out of our crowded lives. You know, at no time in history, people's lives have been so crowded than in our generation. And Jesus, as he called the disciples out of their crowded lives, he's calling us. Calling us into the boat, to get into the boat. And when the disciples got into the boat, you would think that everything was normal, everything was so peaceful. No. There was a storm. And as there was a storm, as Jesus was sleeping in the, in the boat, the disciples, most of, several of them, had grown up on the sea. Uh, so therefore, they were well versed to how to handle the storms. So they would have tried everything that they had learned from their childhood. But they could not really bring the ship under the boat under control. So they wake up Jesus, and Jesus rebukes the crowd, uh, rebukes the, uh, the, the, the waves and the wind and the storm, and it ceases. And disciples were amazed that, that the wind and the waves obeyed Jesus. You know, sometimes when Jesus calls us out of the crowd and out of our crowded lives into the boat, it might really appear as if, oh no, there are storms. And Jesus, very often, he stills the storms. But sometimes he stills us and not the storm. But as long as Jesus is there in the boat, he can either still the storm or he can still us. So on this particular day, January 1st, 2023, I just want to challenge you that we would come to a place where we would get into the boat with Jesus. We would leave our crowds, we would leave our crowded lives, and we'd say, I want to get to know Jesus better. And how can we get to know Jesus better? The Bible says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is a central part of Christian faith. And if you and I want to get to know Jesus, the best way that you and I can get to know Jesus is to focus on the written Word. No, because this Word that we uh, read is not just printed words on paper, but it's life-giving word. You know, as I mentioned earlier some time ago, although it is written by almost, although it is written by almost uh, uh, 40 different 
writers, there's only one author. The author is the Holy Spirit. Although it was written over 1,500 years on different continents, in different countries, by people from different professions, there's one author. And there's perfect alignment between different aspects of the scripture. You know, we just celebrated Jesus' birth. Even surrounding Jesus' birth and his uh, uh, death, there are so many prophecies that were prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born or before Jesus uh, died on the cross. And they were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So if we get into the boat, the word of God is so central. So I want to really challenge you as we enter into this new year to get away from the crowd, to get out of our crowded lives, to get into the boat and get to know who Jesus is. And the disciples found out who Jesus was when he stilled the storm. You know, this is the best picture that I could really find an illustration, but the Bible records for us. And as the storm was stilled, they worshiped Jesus. Now we see here that the disciples worship. Hitherto they had known Jesus as a healer. Hitherto they had known Jesus as a good person, as a teacher. But now they found out that Jesus was God who was uh, having control over the wind and the waves. So when you and I are in the boat, when we surround ourselves with the word of God, then you and I will have a greater revelation of who Jesus is. And the result is that we worship him. So I want to challenge you today to be able to hold on to the Bible, which, is the, which gives us knowledge, which gives us truth, which gives us hope in every situation. Now, so there's three questions I want to ask today, or I want to answer today. Why read the Bible? You know, it might sound like a, a, a Bible 101 or Theology 101, but I think it's so often so useful for us to come back to the very basics. Why do we read the Bible? Who will help us understand the Bible? Because obviously it contains 66 books, a lot of complexity is there. So who will, understand, who will help us to understand the Bible? And secondly, how do I interpret the Bible? So let's just unpack each of these questions and then I will leave you with some uh, challenge for the new year. First of all, why do we read the Bible? Because reading the Bible, it gives us an opportunity to learn who God is. You know, the Bible contains his message about life, about relationships, about work, about family, all of the things that are related to your life and my life. So reading the Bible helps us to get to know who God is. Secondly, the Bible contains accounts of God interacting with individual people. Now, ordinary individual people, to people who were uh, on thrones as kings, people who had the gift of prophecy, but throughout the Bible, we see that God was interacting with people, men and women, children, and older people of all ages and all professions. So the Bible contains accounts of God interacting with people. Now it shows us how God cares for humanity. And then fourthly, the Bible explains clearly how to have a personal relationship with God. The Bible actually charts out a path for us so that what we are gathering in this, in, uh, by reading the Bible is not just in our intellect but that it distills to our heart and therefore transforms our everything that we uh, do or live for. And the Bible explains clearly how to have that personal relationship with God. Many years ago I read a track, it said, uh, the title said, Missed heaven, Missing Heaven by 12 Inches. And I wondered, you know, it was cap captivated by that uh, title, so I started to read that uh, very small tract uh, uh, that was given, that was put out, uh, I think it was by Canadian Bible Society. So I be, as I began to read it, they said, no, many people miss heaven by 12 inches because the distance between head and heart is 12 inches. So they've got all the head knowledge, but they've never allowed that knowledge to distill into, your, into their hearts and therefore transform 
You know, physiologically, a heart is the one that pumps blood to different parts of the body and therefore keeps the tissues alive. If any tissue doesn't get the blood or uh, which delivers oxygen even for a short period of time, there is an irreversible damage that happens to that part. But the heart plays a key role in that. So the Bible explains how to have that personal relationship with God from mere knowledge to experiential. And then, fourthly, God's word is the only unchanging reality in this world. A lot of things change. You know, when I was teaching at the university, almost every year, I would get uh, uh, from the publisher new textbooks. You know, about 10, 15, 16, uh, 15, 20 of them, like thick textbooks. And there was nothing wrong with the old textbook. And this was a newer edition. A seventh edition has very, uh, had very few revisions compared to the sixth edition. Maybe compared to the first edition, there were a lot more editions. But every year, they would be giving me the books. And then I had to discard the older books. And I would just leave them outside. Students would come and take them. But your Bible is the only word that is unchanging. For 2,000 years in the Bible, as you and I know it, has not changed. People have tried to kings and leaders uh, uh, who are antagonistic towards Christianity and the word of God had tried to destroy it, but they have not been successful. In fact, that's the most popular book in the world today that is translated to more languages than any other book in the world. God's word is the only one that is unchanging. In fact, Jesus said, and Matthew records for us, Luke records for us, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. It will not pass away. So God's word is the only one that will not pass away. And that's one of the reasons why you and I need to be reading the Bible. Now, just a passing comment here. Uh, no, Jesus said... Uh, Heaven and earth will pass away. And obviously this refers to the physical earth and physical heaven, the material that the earth and heaven are, uh, are, are contained, but not the spirits and souls. Because the scripture clearly says that people outlast the current material universe, either to a state of eternal bliss or to a state of eternal misery. And that the current universe will be replaced by another world that will never end and that will be unalloyed and not contaminated by sin. Now the passing of heaven and earth is not something that Jesus uh, 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 mentioned for the first time. In fact, the scripture, Isaiah prophesied that. Let me read those two, two passages for you. I don't have them uh, on, on the overhead. Uh, Isaiah 34 chapter 4th verse, Isaiah prophesied, all the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. So Isaiah already predicted that heaven and earth will pass away. And then the Lord assured that his people, even though the heaven and earth will pass away, that God's salvation is secure. Secure in the lives of everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as their savior. Isaiah goes on to say in Isaiah 51 verse 6, The heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies, but my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. So God's word outlasts everything. And God's salvation outlasts everything everything. So you and I need to be reading the Bible because you and I can learn about God. Because you and I can learn how God interacts with people and most importantly us. And how you and I can have a personal relationship with God and how you and I can have handle of this word of life which stands when everything fails and fades away. No, this is so important because during the Christmas story, or in one of the Christmas stories that we read that is recorded for us by Matthew, when there was confusion, when the wise men came, the Magi came to Jerusalem, and people were confused as to where this king was born, because King Herod was the only king that was alive. And the only thing that came to their rescue was the word of God. 
your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path it was the scribes and the pharisees the scribes and uh, leaders of the jewish faith that were able to discover in micah fifth chapter second verse but you bethlehem ephrata who are too little to be among the clans of judah out of you shall come forth a ruler of israel so amidst the confusion and hopelessness and pain it's god's word that came to the rescue which was prophesied hundreds of years ago so in the midst of the confusion that we face in the world that we are living in it's god's word that can give us hope it's god's word that can give us the strength to move forward in the midst of the hopelessness that we see all around and people are already predicting i don't yesterday i got so many uh, 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 i i guess uh, links to what people were talking about their predictions for 2023 and and the prognosis is not good in the midst of all of those bad prognoses it's heaven and earth will pass away all of the bank balances and the investments may disappear but god's word will remain forever that's why we read the bible because it's eternal now who will help us to read and understand the bible you know as i mentioned you and i we find it difficult to understand the bible but god has given to us his holy spirit who lives in us as we become christ followers bible very clearly talks about his spirit living in us and paul in writing to the church in corinth in the in the second chapter he talks about you have the holy spirit living in you so as you read the bible god's word a god's spirit enables you to understand the holy word and then you have the help of the church you know as much as god has given us a mind none of us can be too arrogant and say i don't need anybody to interpret the word god has given us the church god has given us the prophets you know there was a situation when uh, ethiopian eunuch had come to worship god in jerusalem was going back reading from isaiah uh, from isaiah 53 he couldn't understand it and god abrupt uh, abruptly interrupted the the ministry of uh, uh, philip and sent him to uh, this uh, de- desert in gaza where he was able to help this ethiopian eunuch the finance minister of ethiopia to understand what he was reading and in fact uh, the the finance minister says how can someone how can i understand unless someone explains it to me and apostle paul writes and he prays in ephesians 3rd chapter 18th verse you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints you know some of you who were at the uh, christmas eve service uh, at uh, a main campus pastor uh, matthew chu was preaching and in the midst of uh, uh, the sermon he was talking about uh, uh, john's gospel 14 uh, uh, first uh, chapter 14th verse he said the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory okay and then he said the uh, seen his glory in the son who came from the father full of grace and truth now, as i read as i heard that for the first time you know i've been, i've read the scripture many many times but when i come to the house of god you know there's some statement that the preacher unpack that just enables the light to go on So as Pastor Matthew was talking about this immediately I I I took my iPhone and started writing down the notes you know full of grace and truth in Jesus Christ and as I was reflecting on that phrase full of grace and truth it just made me to appreciate the balance between grace and truth that Jesus brings you know grace without truth is meaningless truth without grace is mean let me explain to you now if you had a uh, if when you were a student reflect on your life when you were a student and if there was a teacher who only showed you the grace but did not tell you the truth that you had done something wrong in the in the test or the exam that wouldn't be helpful no that grace that she is showing you all the time without the truth would be meaningless in it will not help you to get to where you are 
on the other hand if the teacher was only focusing on truth it would be so mean that it will never enable you to appreciate the gift that god has given to you to come up to where you have come up but it's only in jesus there is a perfect balance between grace and truth and i got this understanding like as i was listening to that uh, sermon just a week ago even though i had read this passage many many times so there is a church to help us to understand the bible you know these days people say that most people consider themselves regular in a church if they attend the church twice a month now if you come only two times a month and that is all across western world and most people actually attend the church once a month and still consider themselves to be regular and therefore they are depriving themselves on the opportunity of enlightening of getting their minds enlightened by the word of god by the preaching of god's word and thirdly you have the benefit of reason you know apostle paul encourages each person to be fully convinced in their own mind and god has given each of us minds to be able to understand the scripture and if you juxtapose it with the uh, the input we get from the church the input we get from the spirit of god that lives within us it will enable us he will enable us to understand the bible thirdly how do we interpret the bible you know and this is a challenging situation for uh, many of us because the old testament is written in aramaic in hebrew mostly and in aramaic whereas the new testament is written in greek but you can be confident that you can pick up any translation and god's word will speak to you you know it doesn't really matter which translation you are uh, you, you are studying in order to understand this question you need to see is it a literature so next next point okay what is, then you need to really figure out what does it mean and for you to really understand what it really means you need to figure out is it a historical writing is it poetry is it prophecy is it ap- apocalyptic or is it law or wisdom or gospel now i think that we need to understand and secondly you need to understand what it meant to the person who first wrote it and to those who first read it or heard it but most importantly you need to ask your question this question what difference does the coming of jesus make when you read the old testament that is very important for us to understand and ultimately the bible is all about jesus in the old testament jesus is concealed but in the new testament jesus is revealed so it's all about jesus the third most important thing is how does the bible apply to my life how does the bible apply to my life no to wa- avoid it becoming a mere intellectual exercise you must think through how it applies to your daily living you know it's just unbelievable even when you make it a practice how god speaks to you now what i've just so far said so far probably is something that you have heard many times you know why do i read the bible who will help me understand the bible how do you uh, how do i interpret the bible but the next transition i want to make is to make it personal as we stand on 1st of january 2023 is do you want to commit to filling your mind with god's word through discipline you know and then that's really what it comes down to yes we have got crowded lives Yes there is a lot of uh, different messages that we are getting from the crowd but Jesus is asking us to get into the boat to get to know him and the only way you and I can get to know him is by studying his word because it's his word that is eternal so as we come into this first day of this year could i challenge you to read the scripture every day you know and as you read the scripture every day it enlightens your mind in a way that nothing else has 
Let me give you one example, personal example. You know, there was a time in my life uh, that I'd, uh, I was doing my second postdoctoral fellowship and uh, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no job prospect uh, that was uh, in the horizon. So I was very discouraged. And at that time we were living in Scarborough. So I was taking the train to go to the university and I, this was a, I was very discouraged. And uh, uh, what added to my discouragement was one of my closest friends and colleagues who was uh, a good friend of mine that was uh, doing in, uh, like working in research along with me. Uh, he had applied for a job and he got a job. And I, that made me more sad because not only was there no job prospect for me, but that, that my friend had gotten a permanent job and, uh, there was, and he wasn't even a Christian. So I was just sitting in the, in the train, just uh, uh, complaining to God and said, like, you know, I've been following you, I've done all these things for you, but you know, I, like, the future looks so bleak for me. And look at this guy, he doesn't even know you, but you know, things are working out for him. And on that particular day, I was in the habit of reading through the Psalms. Uh, on the train. So on that particular day, I happened to be reading Psalm 37. And uh, this is what it said, Psalm 37. Let me read a few verses for you. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who uh, do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. And so shall thou dwell in the land and enjoy the safe pastures. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still and know that I am God. No? It's not that I was looking for a passage, but as I was in the habit of reading the scripture, and as I read this scripture, like tears started flowing down my, uh, my cheeks. And I said, Lord, thank you that you love me so much, that you have designed your word to encourage me in this a specific area at a specific time. And 35 years later, or th yeah, 30 years, 35 years later, as I look back at this passage, every part of this passage he has fulfilled. Now, I would have missed out on God speaking to me, encouraging me, if I wasn't, the hab if I wasn't in the habit of reading the word of God. Now, sometimes you may not be in a mood to read the word, but get into the habit of reading the word every day. You know, let me challenge you. Now, there may be ways that you are already in the practice of reading God's word every day. But there's so many different ways that you can do it. You know, there are 52-week reading plans that uh, tons of them on the internet that you can pick up. You know, I, in, in, uh, in uh, earlier days, I would be thinking, oh, I don't want to be reading a, a, a structured plan, you know, because I would be just rushing through it and therefore not getting the meat out of it. But then I've grown out of that immaturity. Because sometimes, even through the habits of routine, God begins to speak to you. He begins to arrest you in your tracks. So if you don't have a plan, you might want to download some plan. Now, what I have been using the last few years is that I read through the Bible. Uh, uh, right, I've got two different versions of Bible. So I read through the Bible, underlining them. And uh, because of the stage of life I am in in the last two years, uh, 2021, I was able to finish reading through the Bible uh, in the first eight months. And then last year, 2022, I was able to finish it in the first six months. So, because I'm not as smart as most of you, so I actually have to underline for things to get into my head. So I've got different markers that I've been using to, uh, to uh, underline these uh, different uh, passages that I've been reading through. No, but that, I call it my study part of the Bible. But I also, read the Bible every day. I don't have a 52-week plan. I have what is called a Bible in one year app. I'm not suggesting you should use this. Anything that you can find to give you some structure and discipline, download it or create your own plan to read it. It's just unbelievable how much you will be able to grow. So can I challenge you here in 2023 so that you can commit to hearing the word of God 
listening to the word of God as you read the scripture. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will remain forever. You know, yeah, in fact, what I've got here uh, is uh, my, my uh, cell phone, uh, all of the apps that I've got. And what is in, in the circle is the Bible in one year app. You know, what's the most beautiful thing about this that I find is that this app, either you can read it every day or you can listen to it. You know, if you click on uh, the Bible the, where it says the picture, it automatically scrolls you down to an introduction, to a wisdom passage, to a New Testament passage, to an Old Testament passage. You don't even have to go back to the Bible. It automatically, everything is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, flowing seamlessly. But the most important thing that I like most is that for every section, for the wisdom section, or the uh, New Testament section, or the Old Testament section, you have got a scripture that you can read or listen to, and then there is a commentary, a small, a short sermonette, and then there's a prayer at the end. It takes you about 22 minutes to read it if you spend every day, and it takes you about 18 minutes to listen to it if you put it at a fast 1.2 uh, fast uh, track. 18 minutes. Now that's not a lot, lot of time at all, but it's unbelievable how God speaks to you through his word. So I want to challenge you. Maybe you're already in the practice of reading the word of God every day. Maybe you don't have a structure. You know, someone said, no, structure without spontaneity is constraining. Spontaneity without structure leads to confusion. So you need to have a balance between a structure and spontaneity. And you know, if I were to be honest with you, there are times, I, there are a few days I miss reading this Bible, uh, but I can't get caught up. You know, the trick of the devil is, oh, you've already missed four days, forget it now. So if you've missed four days, go for a walk, listen to the four days that you've missed. Get caught up. Or if you don't, if you don't have the time, if the life stage that you are in is too busy, then get caught up with wherever you have left off. Or get caught up with the day that, uh, uh, that uh, on that particular day that uh, you discovered that you've missed the four days. But get into the habit. It's just unbelievable how God can speak to you through his word. Now, the greatest blessing we pastors can give you is encourage you and encourage ourselves to get back to the word. Because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain forever. So I trust and pray at the end of this year we would be able to celebrate of what God has spoken to us and how God has transformed us. You know the amazing thing about God's word is God doesn't God's word when you read it, it doesn't give you just intellectual knowledge. It gives you an experiential transformation. Nobody may know what's going on in your heart, but God knows what's going on in your heart. And his word is able to convict to encourage, to strengthen, and to bless. Now, I actually started reading this Bible, uh, reading Bible every day when I was eight, uh, 11 years old. Now, I, uh, like I, we used to have these notebooks, and in the notebook, I ripped a page, and uh, I used to, every day after I finished my portion, whatever the portion I allotted myself, I wasn't, like, there, were no, no, the, no, there, there weren't all these apps and things like that. But I would just finish my portion and put my signature there. And at the end of the month, I would just reflect on it. And I'll tell you, 55 years or 54 years have gone by, but every time I read the scripture, there's something new that I learn. There's something transformative that I experience, something encouraging that I find. So can I challenge you in this new year to make the word of God a priority out of your crowded life, out of the crowd, you come out to come to Jesus. You know, when Jesus, when, the, when Jesus rebuked the storm, he said, where is your faith? You know, some of you probably feel overwhelmed. You know, someone said the word F-A-I-T-H, faith. If you, he broke it down uh, uh, to feeling afraid, I trust him. So you might be feeling afraid. Oh, how am I going to read this scripture? Am I going to understand it? Am I actually going to f follow through on the commitment that I make? Feeling afraid, trust him. And start on this journey. And let's, as a church, embark on the journey. No matter what stage of life we are in. In the beginning was the word. 
and the word was God, with God, and the word was God, and this word he has made available to you and me. Let us recommit ourselves to the word. Let us pray. Now tell God in your own hearts, Lord, I really want to commit. Yeah, there's so many things that you have done in my life. I love you more than anything else. But somehow I've never been able to discipline myself to study the word. And this 2023, I want it to be transformative. I want to make it a priority to read your word. Your word says, the psalmist said, taste and see, the Lord is good. So help Jesus, Jesus help each of us to taste and see how good you are through the encouragement and through the admonition, through the instructions, through the revelations, through the prophecy that you want to speak to us through your word. And we want to become a people of the word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.